Hi everyone and welcome. I'm Mark Lynn, Head of Digital Business for NetSync. Today we'll be talking about return to school in a post-pandemic world, presented by Cisco and NetSync. Obviously, we live in trying times. The pandemic, COVID-19, has had a dramatic impact across the globe. It's affected ways of life, how we work, how we learn, how we do anything. And one of those, in regards to learning, which we'll be talking about today, is how to get around having that kind of one-to-one -one that you normally have with the students and helping them learn. The impact, when you think about that, is dramatic. So using collaboration tools to try to have that same type of relationship is changing the way people have to think about teaching. It also has changed the way students have to think about learning. So today we're thinking about things in collaboration. And we also are worried about things about, you know, Zoom bombing. We're worried about, we have, new, we have all kinds of new acronyms, right? And uh, BYOD, things like this that have become so important to our changed world. So when you think about all the elements of that, and you think about then having to secure it as well, and having something that is at least closely represents how you were teaching before, but now in the digital world, it's one of those things that requires a lot of thought, it requires planning, and it requires choosing great partners. So today we have three great speakers to talk to you about the return to school in a post-pandemic world. First up, we have Lenny Shad, Chief of Information and Innovation Officer, District Administration. Mr. Shad has worked in the K-12 education since 2003 and has successfully led BYOD in one-on-one -on -one for Katie and Houston ISDs. He's a published author, and his book, Bring Your Own Learning, Transform Instruction with Any Device, has helped many organizations with their digital transformation initiatives. Lenny will be discussing the current state and the challenges that are currently facing, including those related to funding. Welcome, Lenny. Thank you, Mark, and, and good morning, good afternoon to you, depending on where you are in the, in the country. Uh, my name is Lenny Shad, and I'm excited to be here. Just a quick uh, piece of background on me. Uh, I've been in this technology field since 1987. For the first half of my career, uh, I spent in the private sector and uh, did hospitality, government, oil and gas, some investment banking, but it was when I was in the investment bank that I really got some exposure to incident management, incident response. We had a, a hurricane that came through uh, and it was Tropical Storm Allison in downtown Houston flooded the downtown. And that's when I started to learn that there's more to crisis management, incident response than just having a plan. In 2003, I went over and joined KDISD and uh, spent 10 years there was very fortunate in that district that I got my first exposure to mobile learning, remote learning, uh, anytime, anywhere learning. And, and so I was heavily involved in the initiative that rolled uh, devices out to the hands of kids, but I was more than just the technology person. Uh, I had responsibility over integrating in the curriculum and the, the professional development. So I started to get a really holistic perspective on what it takes to provide anytime, anywhere learning. And then in 2013, I decided to go over and work for Houston ISD, uh, and I was in Houston, and we actually were one of the first large urbans to roll uh, devices out to all of our high school kids, about 50,000 high school kids. And again, I was responsible for that initiative, uh, not just from the technology perspective, but from the uh, instructional, the practice content perspective. Uh, while I was in Houston, we had Hurricane Harvey that came through, and and again, you know, we had our incident response, our crisis management plans, and uh, there's so much more to them than just having a plan. And between Tropical Storm Allison, um, my, my exposure to Anytime Anywhere Learning in Katy, and then, then again in Houston, and then uh, Hurricane Harvey, what I, what I quickly realized is the emotional side to change is what has to really be understood and accounted for. And when you look at what we're going through in the pandemic, um, is that is even exacerbated further because this isn't a point in time where we're gonna go back to the way we did things before. This has redefined our new normal and redefined what education and instruction is gonna look like. 
So how do you take that monumental, very disruptive change and begin to now have it become a fabric within your learning system? That's what I think the challenge is for leaders today. And as technology leaders, technology is at the heart of all of this. So how do you really start to bring people together around this? In 2019, I left Houston and went to work for district administration, and I'm very fortunate in this role, I get to work with superintendents and academic officers and, and technology leaders, helping them understand the power of cross-functional planning and what, really, what it takes to be a very well-oiled functioning system. Um, I have technology leadership academies and technology leadership summits where we point, talk about very specific things. And, and I'm very fortunate and really have enjoyed this role. I'm also on the board of directors for a number of organizations. So I wanted to give you a sense before I start talking and you, you all are sitting out there going, well, who is this guy and, and what's his background? Been in heavily involved in this whole anytime, anywhere remote learning and then as it relates to crisis management. So I want to take us back to, uh, to, to March. And all of a sudden we were thrown into this, this firefight. And every district in the country had to go into firefighting mode. Uh, and overnight we had to basically take a, a, an, an entire organization and transform them into being a remote operation, working from home. And whether we were ready or not, this was our reality. And it didn't matter what our current state capability was, this was our new, new situation we had to deal with. So we didn't even have the opportunity to look and evaluate where our people were, where our processes were, where our technology was. We were having to, to deal with this and, and implement remote strategies across the organization. Just think about, for the technology people in the room, think about your support model and how it was geared for an on-site workforce. And now your entire workforce is, is remote and how do you support that? So we didn't have time nor luxury. And so what, what that ended up being is where you were, it was what it was and you had to react very quickly and make some decisions that had you had a longer runway, you probably would have made differently, but because you didn't have a long runway, you had to jump into. And the transition was quick and there were security gaps out there. And the, uh, the, the, the players on the other side of this who were, want those, those security gaps, they know about it. And we're actually starting to see that uh, cybersecurity issues coming to the forefront. And what we learned in that two month time in the March and April and May was pushing change doesn't work, right? The organization, because it was a crisis, they reacted very well to it, but they didn't embrace it, all right? And they didn't, if they didn't say, okay, this is, this is where I want to be. It was forced on them. A lot of people thought this is just like a hurricane. It's going to be disruptive for a couple of months and then it's going to go away and we're going to move on. Instead, what we need to be thinking about is how am I getting the organization ready? So March and April were a firefight, firefighting mode. We cannot survive in that mode. Now, it's, it's not going away. This is now the new fabric, the new culture we want to implement and we want to institute and have it become institutionalized. How do I get the organization ready for change? And as leaders, this is the question you should be asking for your start of school. What, when I think about start of school, how am I getting the organization ready and what does that look like? So when we think about start of school, this continuation that it's not gonna go away, we have many, many challenges. Are we gonna be face-to-face? -face? Are we gonna be hybrid? Are we gonna be all virtual? And depending on what's going on in a given week, we're all over the board right now. The, the safest path is that you're gonna have some form of hybrid instruction. And you're gonna hear from some later speakers about that, how they're actually planning to take that on. Many of you are deploying devices, which is, a, is, a, is not an easy thing. Scheduling, how do you schedule? for half your, your, your student body remote, half of your student body on face-to-face, -face. same with your teacher. How do you schedule for that campus that's gonna have its first incident and have to close down and then all the kids are remote? Do you have an SIS that allows you to do this what-if planning? Because the principal's gotta be thinking through this long before school starts. What kind of sanitation are you gonna be doing? If you're doing distributions and deployments, how is that gonna work? Because you're not gonna want parents walking through are students walking through picking up devices if they're in a remote setting? So are you gonna set a centralized position? So all of these things are coming to force. You have people on your staff who are considered high risk, who are not gonna come back. We have teachers who are considered high risk. Custodians, cafeteria workers, bus drivers, what kind of staffing issues are we gonna have? 
And then, as I said, what's our incident response going to be if we do have a crisis at a campus? And then ultimately, cybersecurity. What are we doing to protect our kids? And so what I say is we're in this metaphor has gone wild, uncharted territory, breaking new ground, break the rules, be creative, innovative, boil those all down into one thing, and that is we are in the midst of one of the most disruptive changes we've seen. And so how do you deal with disruptive change? And so again, I'm putting myself in your position as leaders getting ready to start the school year. Here's what I'm thinking about is in March and April, our parents were very accommodating to, uh, to what the situation was. They are not gonna be as accommodating in, in, in August and September. They are going to expect improvement. And my question that I've asked many superintendents across the country as well as IT leaders who do you want setting the expectation for you for what start of school looks like? The remote learning, virtual learning is, a, is at a minimum two or three year project. You guys are six months into it. So given the fact that there's no way you can be ready to be complete with this, what is the expectation and who is setting it? This is one of my favorite quotes, every beginning is a consequence, our consequence is COVID, every beginning ends something. And so now we are a new normal, so what are we doing to abandon the way we've done things in the past and embrace the things in the future. The key behind all of change and, and whether people embrace it or they fight it is expectation. And expectation has to deal with the belief you have in your own mind or the belief people are telling you, right? And there's gonna be the positives and the negatives out there. And ex these, it's these expectations about what I believe is gonna happen that guide my behavior. So if, I'm, if I get the right expectation set, then I'm gonna have the right kind of behavior. And when I think about change, there's three states of change, current state, transition state, future state. Current state, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on. It's that old pair of slippers. It's the comfort. It's how I do my job every day. Transition state is chaotic and it's disorganized and it's changing and it's emotional. And how am I gonna do my job? And I, there's anxiety and there's fear. There's all of these things out there it's where we're at right now, and it's where we're going to be for at least a year, is deep in this, in this transition state. Just think about people's personal lives. Some of them are, are worried about whether they're going to have a house to live in. Their, their spouse, their partner might have just lost a job. They might be dealing with death. So on top of this very disruptive change that you as an organization are having to put in, you have to also consider the emotional state of what, where your, your, your employees are. And then you have the future state. It's the promise of what's going to get better. And for us, we're talking about the future state being this virtual anytime, anywhere learning that we were all thrust up into. And now we're saying that's where we want to be. But the, the caveat here is we're two, three years away from being in the end zone of this. But we're going to work very hard to show the transition on how we're going to get there and the steps necessary. So as we think about the current state and the transition state and the transition state that we're in is chaotic and messy, and you're going to have a bunch of people saying we can never do this and that we shouldn't do this, the way that you navigate and you, can, you keep people on this, this ship, on this path, is by managing expectations. And so what you want to do is you want to build the expectation and you want to set it and you want to continually keep reviewing it because that is what's going to maintain the buy-in and the support. Setting and maintaining the right expectations is what's going to keep this, the, the group of people with you, even when there's ebbs and flows and peaks and valleys. So how do I set the right expectation? And there's, these, are, these are very simple steps, but they're often steps that are never thought of. You have to spend time explaining why. Now, you might think everybody out there that the why has already been defined for us, it's COVID, but there are still a lot of people who are, are thinking COVID is that hurricane scenario where we're gonna go back to the way we've always taught. So what we need to do is we need to explain to people, know that this is going to be the new way we want to instruct from this point forward, and that we're going to be here to help you along that journey. And once you have a good level of, 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 of understanding the why, then you can talk about how you wanna get that done. But too often we jump right to the how and we don't spend enough time on the why, and we never have that layer of understanding. You need to be constantly talking about your goals, right? And when we think about strategic planning now, we can't think in two, three, four-year increments. We've got to think in, in terms of strategic sprints. What am I doing between March and start of school? 
that's going to show we're, we were better than we were in March. And then what am I going to do three months later after school starts that says, you know what, we're better than we were at the start of school. So I, I call them strategic sprints because we are doing some heavy, heavy lifting that we don't have the luxury of saying, well, trust us, hang with us, because in a year we're going to be a lot better. It's so disruptive. We need to be doing this in terms of sprints where we can come back and say we're better than we were before. And we have to be realistic in what we're painting, right? Don't promise unicorns. And don't hide issues. We are in the midst of disruptive change. Some things are going to work. Some things aren't going to work. But if you try and hide the things that don't work, when we talk about setting the right expectation and people staying with you through the course, it's not going to work. And you must create feedback loops from, your, from the workforce, the people with boots on the ground. They've got to have an avenue to take this in. There's a quote from the movie, and it's my favorite quote. And in and, and this time, people want leadership, right? And in your school district, they want leadership. And, and in the absence of a genuine leader, they're going to listen to whoever steps up in the microphone. My question to you is, in your district, who's stepping up to the microphone and talking about what start of school is going to be? Who's stepping up to the microphone in your department and saying, here's what start of school is going to be, and here's the new direction that we're going to go, and here's how we're going to get there? I guarantee you, if it's not the leader, if it's not you, somebody else is. And then the question is, what is the message that they're delivering? And, and I, I would venture to say nine times out of ten, it's not the message that you want. So if we think in terms of, of this start of school um, and we think in terms of leadership and what we would expect from our leaders uh, and, and setting the right tone for our district, setting the right tone for our community and for our students, here's some closing thoughts that, that I'm going to share with you before we start getting into some great examples of, of how districts around us are really taking this bull by the horn. And, and really setting the tone for start of school. The emotional state of your employees, you cannot ignore it, right? Their personal lives are, are potentially in flux. There's a loss of jobs. They're worrying about housing. They're worrying about food. They're worrying about insurance. They might be dealing with death. There's wor just straight up worry and fear and anxiety. And as a leader, if you think simply rolling out a plan and having a really good plan is enough to carry you through this disruptive change, you're going to be sadly, sadly unhappy when it doesn't occur. Take the emotional state of your employees in, into consideration, and it has to be an element in the, the planning, but, but it has to be something you're, you have up at the front. When talking about change, put yourself in their position. So it's very easy to sit on top of that mountain and bark orders, but, but put yourself into their position, and how would you react if somebody in came in and told you what you're about to tell them. By just doing that simple step, I guarantee you your messaging will look different. Embrace this concept of strategic sprints. I think it's incredibly important. We, we should not assume that the tolerance we saw in March and April from our parents is going to be the same tolerance that you're going to have moving forward, because it's not. So the way I, I manage this is in strategic sprints, and I articulate how I'm better than I was at my last sprint. Our last sprint was March and April. Here's where I'm going to be better at the start of school. And then in three months, here's where I'm going to be better than the start of school. And I work this way out to 15, 18 months. Celebrate the win. This is, this is disruptive. It's emotional. It's painful. And if you don't celebrate the wins, it's also very difficult for people to continue and want to be with you in those troughs. Celebrate the win. And if I'm an IT leader, I don't want somebody dictating what my start of school looks like. I'm going to dictate it. And I'm going to say, here's what will be ready at the start of school, and here's my next sprint, and my next sprint, and my next sprint. But if I'm, if I'm in charge of an IT department, I will articulate out what you can expect for start of school. I would highly encourage you to do that. As I mentioned, here's some of our events. We have an academy October 8th through the 10th, and the second session of that academy is the 10th through the 12th. It's a virtual academy, um, and if you have, want more information, go to daleadershipinstitute.com. Very exciting. We have some really interesting districts who are, are, are participating in this. It's meant for leadership teams. Send your leadership team to this academy, and we're going to teach you how to become a really effective team. Then we also have uh, summits that are just point-in-time sessions on, on issues of the day. So, once again, thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity. If there's ever anything I can do for you, get you resources, point you into other directions, give, get you contact with somebody, 
Here's my uh, email address, lennyshad at gmail.com. Please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Mark, it's back to you. Thanks, Lenny. That was fantastic. Really appreciate you joining us here today. Next up, we have Brian Kolbeck, the Chief of Technology for Louisville ISD. Mr. Kolbeck oversees three divisions that provide technology services to the Louisville ISD that include technical services, information services, and network infrastructure and cybersecurity services. Under his leadership, the Louisville ISD was the first school district to, in Texas to be awarded the Consortium for School Networks Trusted Learning Environment Seal. Today, Brian will be discussing distance learning initiatives that Louisville ISD implemented before the summer break, including how they're preparing to return to school in the fall. Take it away, Brian. All right, thanks, Mark. Appreciate the introduction. <clears throat> um, my name is Brian Kolbeck, as Mark said. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Louisville ISD. I'm originally from East Texas, as you can hear in my accent. Just kidding. I'm originally uh, originally from Wisconsin, but I've been in Texas for about five years, and certainly the last three or four months have been the most uh, interesting during my time as the Chief Technology Officer for Louisville ISD. What I'm going to do is uh, take some time to kind of unpackage what we did in the spring in response to COVID-19, and then um, break those down, explain uh, why we did certain things, where we found successes, and then ultimately kind of foreshadow some of the things we're, we're looking at and working on as we prepare you know, for the 2021 school year. So a little bit about uh, Louisville, ID, uh, Louisville ISD before we get started. We're, we are located just northwest of Dallas, about 25 miles. We're a suburban school district. We have just over 52,000 students. Um, we have over 6,000 employees. We're covering about 127 square miles. Our uh, District size with that, we have 69 schools, we're covering 13 different municipalities, and we have about 33% of our students that are on, on free reduced lunch. Um, so that is a little bit of the lay of the land. In addition to that, one of the, I, I think, unique things for us is that we had a large one-to-one -one initiative already in place. Um, really, it started in about 2012, so we're really on the, the second iteration of that already. And that helped us um, be more fluid in this uh, case. Our one-to-one -one pre COVID was in grades four through 12. And then in our classrooms, we had um, class sets of, of iPads that um, we had about seven iPads in every elementary PK through three classroom. And I'll talk a little bit about how we use that uh, technology. So we were um, fortunate to have a lot of technology available. Uh, we do uh, annually survey our students as well um, with our back to school forms. We survey our, our parents about internet access. And, you know, when, when COVID hit too, we rolled out another survey. So typically we're seeing about mm, low to mid 90s. Uh, I'd say probably around 92, 93% of our students are saying that they have internet access at home. Our parent surveys are about that same ballpark as well. So um, thankfully, we have a lot of uh, internet access already in the home that helped, helped our transition. But certainly, we had um, gaps that we needed to address. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that we've done uh, to do that. Another unique thing in our case, as far as internet access, uh, a few years ago, I applied for the district to be part of the Sprint 1 Million project. Fortunately, we were able uh, to participate in that. So in for students in grades 9 through 12, uh, we already had hotspots that we were checking out to students that did not have internet access at home. Um, Pre-COVID, that program was only available with students 9 through 12. They've now expanded that program from uh, K through 12, but they're not really increasing the number of devices. But we can expand that a little bit um, if we have additional devices uh, to hand out to students beyond just grades 9 through 12 going forward. Um, so really, let's turn back the clock. We, we are, uh, in our situation, we ended up going into spring, spring break. Um, when we went into our spring break, that's really when everything hit with COVID and, you know, implementing the stay-at-home order. That was uh, a very, very busy spring break. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that, that we were doing. And what we ended up doing is really developed uh, phases to our at-home learning plan. And, and those phases really were around um, 
you know, our principals and teachers coming back after spring break and then preparing our, um, our students to come back uh, after, after an extended spring break. So what we ended up doing, we, we, it was very tough because the, the window, just like y'all have experienced, the, the window to make these decisions was short. However, what I, in our case, we had our, our Cisco, uh, we have Cisco call manager for our communications platform. And I saw a real opportunity to, to build upon that um, in, in response to COVID. So what we were really kicking around is using, let's say, a traditional meeting platform there's several of them out there um, to host meetings and then maybe another solution uh, to allow calling. So what we ended up landing on was really the implementation of Cisco WebEx and Cisco WebEx Teams. And the benefit of that is that the, um, the real difference between that and let's say a meeting platform is when you're in a meeting, right, the meeting's over or the meeting's hosted, somebody joins the meeting, when it's over, it's over. What we're really looking at is the ability to really merge um, what I would call different functions. And when I think about the different functions, I think about them in, in really three layers. We were looking for telephony functionality, and we were also looking for you know, a collaboration platform, and also the ability to facilitate meetings. So the combination of using WebEx Teams and Cisco Web WebEx really gave us that. And for the, on the calling side of it, what was uh, the first phase of our at-home learning plan was, you know, even though we have a lot of families that have internet access at home, we know the common denominator for many of those families is uh, still a phone number, right? So what we wanted to do initially was, I would call it almost like a health check, call in, talk about what our first phase to at-home learning would be, um, find out, you know, do, do does the family have technology at home? If so, what are they using? Do they have internet access? And that, and also, when the teachers were going to call, call the families, they had a survey they could send on and have them fill out, have the family fill out the survey. Then we could respond from a deployment perspective. But what was cool about that is we implemented uh, Cisco hybrid calling in in uh, on Cisco WebEx Teams. And what that allowed us to do is really use our phone infrastructure that was already put in place. So all of our extensions that were already in place, um, really our auto attendance that were in place, and probably most importantly, the ability to use the, the campus phone numbers, um, main number as the caller ID. So what we ended up doing is we deployed Cisco WebEx Teams first to all of our staff to, to fit that first phase of calling. And essentially what that allowed them to do is from their laptop, they were able to call families to look up a family's uh, home contact information, see that in Skyward, use uh, WebEx uh, Teams to call that, that cell phone or landline, and the caller ID coming into that number would have been the main campus phone. And that, what was good about that is it, it didn't uh, put our, our staff in a position where they had to you know, call... Uh, Call home or call a family using their personal um, cell phone number. Um, so that was that was very positive and allowed us to make contact on those first first two weeks very very quickly. Additionally, within WebEx Teams, and you know that example I just gave was really external. You know, calling external numbers or receiving calls from external numbers. It also gave us a an immediate communication platform to communicate in district. So while we transitioned everybody working from home. With WebEx Teams, it was really simple as single, almost like single click on a person's name and you were dialed into a, either a voice call or you could elevate it up to a, a video call. So it, it gave us the ability to get on uh, and meet with people quickly as we were trying to mobilize in, in, our, in our response to COVID-19. And then in addition to that, you know, we were also looking to develop spaces and Within WebEx Teams, you have spaces that are what we call kind of a persistent space, a persistent chat space, where um, we use that really in the 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 week planning before our come our return back from spring break. We put in support structures around that. So, for example, we had support support spaces for technology, for digital learning, for our element our principals, elementary principals, middle school principals, high school principals. We use those spaces to help train those group groups of people to communicate with them, um, post videos into those spaces, 
um, where they could use those resources to start creating capacity to build, you know, knowledge with others. So our rollout was really, you know, work with the, our campus principals to get them comfortable using the tools so they could host their own meetings and start building that out, show, show teachers how they were using the tools, obviously communicate their building specific information and district spe specific information. So the spaces became this great environment where regardless if they were in a meeting or not in that space, that the context of what was talked about stayed in there. And if you want to look it up later, or, um, you want to ping somebody real quick, you could do that. Um, so the other interesting part with, with uh, space is it became a really good tool for our teachers where they could have all the kids in a space. So we instructed our, our faculty to create spaces for every course. So in that, in, in, in that course, you know, if I was a fourth grade teacher, it'd be, you know, Brian Kolbeck, fourth grade. And in there, I'd have all my kids in that space so that the, we deployed WebEx teams to all of our uh, iPads. It was very easy for students to, you know, see their meeting schedule. They could click on it and join the meeting. Um, it became very intuitive for our, our staff to do that in a very fast way. Um, in addition to that, with the spaces, I think what was unique to our, our situation, because the, the spaces are there and students can create their own space, they had the, the ability to, to stay connected. There was like a connectedness vibe with our program where we knew there'd be some issues we'd have to you know work through with students perhaps making poor decisions, but it allowed students to stay connected with other students where they could create a space and put other friends in there. It kind of broke down the social barriers where uh, you know, in a brick and mortar school that those kids might be meeting in the lunch lunchroom or on recess and, and talking. When you go to completely online, you lose some of that social emotional connection where this technology kind of allowed us to keep keep kids together. So that was really, really cool. In addition, we implemented uh, Cisco Contact Center. So as I was saying, we were building these structures of support. As we were ramping up our at-home learning program, we, we ended up training just over 400 people to be uh, call center agents. That was really powerful so that we could create a, a call cluster for our, our campuses where people uh, could use uh, Cisco Jabber and Finesse to log in, sign in. You could assign different hours of, of support so people could take those calls. We had uh, data and metrics to look at what our call volumes were. And then we created a second call cluster, which was a group of um, central folks, which were our IT, our instructional uh, technology resources, special ed, um, counseling and social workers, our schools divisions, where if somebody had a question during that time, they could call that main number and, and, and reach people. So that was really great. We were able to extend our hours too by having people centrally cover that. We had you know those call centers start, I think we started around seven o'clock and we, we ended at, um, I think it was seven. I think we had like a 12 hour uh, window in there. Um, in addition, to rolling out you know, the WebEx components, one of the things that we also needed to do is build up our infrastructure. And in our case, you know, we had about 35,000 iPads or so that were already going home. Those iPads uh, tunnel back into our district um, on a VPN. So basically they're aware off the network, a VPN turns on, they tunnel back. To implement conferencing or, or, or anything that's gonna do meetings, if you're looking at WebEx, Zoom, whatever, you, you know, you're looking at about 1.5 meg for a video conference connection. And if we we're bringing all of those clients back with the bandwidth we had, we could have maybe supported 10,000 concurrent connections, and that was not going to work. However, we did not want to sacrifice the filtering that we had set up uh, to, to change that. So we had to pivot super quick, build out basically a new filtering infrastructure that would allow us to keep doing that. But what we did is we architected in a way that we were able to set up a split tunnel. So that traffic that was coming out of somebody's home, if it would identify that, let's say with, with Cisco WebEx, it would route that right out their home instead of back to the district. We did that for WebEx, um, like for example, some of the um, app downloads or, or iOS downloads, things that were bandwidth intensive. We tried to keep that off of our network and preserve, preserve bandwidth. Also on the calling, initially when we started, we were only able to support 250 concurrent call, calls across the whole, whole district. So we knew that wasn't gonna work. Uh, we worked with NetSync to set up uh, what's called SIP over the top, where basically we use um, and basically an internet uh, transport circuit to route our SIP uh, 
SIP communication through where we went from 250 to 1,000 concurrent calls where we could take on that call volume. Um, also, technology access was a big part of this. You know, certainly we needed to, not every student in our grades 4 through 12 opted into having a device and not having one-to-one -one in grades 3 through, or pre-K through 3, we needed to ramp up device technology access. So we set up those surveys. We uh, concurrently, uh, centrally collected the classroom sets of technology. We issued uh, loaner technology to, the, to students that um, did not have a, a device at home. We started off initially trying to make sure we had one device per household, and then we expanded that to um, two students to one device. Um, and that was enough, I think, because so much of it was asynchronous, it was enough to get us, get us through. Our request for devices really fell off after we got to that two to one ratio. Uh, and then, you know, another strategy we worked on is really how do you communicate all this stuff? So we ended up setting up a communication cadence with our communication department where every time we communicate, we typically send that stuff out in um, English, in Spanish, in Chin. So to be responsive on the communication, we really needed to create a schedule on it. So we started started where we were getting all of our communications points by certain days of the week. So if anything was technology related, we needed all that, you know, wrapped up, drafted by, let's say, Wednesday so that we could get it to uh, translators and that that was going to go out, let's say, Thursday evening. And then so we had about a middle of the week communication and then we always had a Sunday Sunday evening communication so that one we weren't establishing communication fatigue and then also it gave us a chance to really say okay what are these key communication points we got to get them drafted get them uh, interpreted or I'm sorry translated and, and sent out so that helped us a lot and then you know as we were rolling out Cisco WebEx Cisco has uh, what's called the control hub and in the control hub there, there's a really good e-discovery tool where really any type of chat or communication, it's archived. However, um, you know, that role, once you assign somebody as a compliance officer in that role, it, they have access to the whole domain. So we really didn't want to do that. So what, what we ended up doing is we took a lot of the data that's in the control hub and we actually put that, um, we, we dumped that into SQL tables and then we created SQL custom reports that campuses could log into that those um, their site to look at their SQL reports and they could see okay which students were engaging in WebEx how often during the week how many you know spaces are they in are they active in there and they could do that on a per student per class they could do it on a, uh, you know at a staff level so we ended up developing some tools that we could have better insights into that engagement so. I want to share, you know, when you think about all of that, that's a lot of stuff I just covered. The adoption on this was fast and it was pretty um, impressive. So what you're seeing right now is basically um, statistics for spring of 2020. So from March 16th through May 27th, I just want to share a few things. We ended up supporting approximately 60,000 WebEx users between our students and staff. On the phone side, I mentioned that our first phases of that it was all about telephony and calling home to families and then obviously the calling teams to teams calling is a big part of that so we had over half a million calls during that time and you know we're almost up to 30 million minutes and that's combined teams to teams and teams to external uh, phone numbers so the calling part was a big part of our strategy and was used heavily to really run our business on the collaboration side um, there we're really talking about using WebEx team spaces where we had that persistent space for chatting, uh, messaging, sharing files, sharing content. We had uh, over a million active spaces in place. Of that, over 12, over 12 million messages sent. And in our elementary, I should have said this earlier for our, our environment, we had Canvas implemented for our LMS, but we were only doing that in grades 6 through 12. And we had mostly Google Classroom and some other tools in place for the elementary. But once we implemented the WebEx Teams piece, teachers were starting to use Teams as a mechanism to uh, collect student work. So if they were doing something where it might be on paper or an art project or something like that, it was very easy for, for a student to take a picture of that, send, send it in for grading uh, on Teams. So that was kind of a cool uh, adoption use case for Teams as well on the collaboration side. And then on the meeting side, we had uh, 188,000 meetings of those 121,000 were video meetings which means more than you know more than uh, two people were in a meeting over 4.4 million meeting minutes and um, 
4,805 unique hosts. Our hosts for me uh, WebEx meetings were primarily our staff. We use WebEx meetings primarily as our our um, our virtual uh, um, our virtual uh, platform for where you're bringing the whole class together. The big reason for that at the time. Uh, WebEx meetings provided grid view if you wanted to have grid view to, to see all the kids in the in this uh, class. And out of that, we had almost 1.5 million participants. Uh, in addition, you know, outside of the WebEx, we handed out um, an additional 3,030 devices, iPads to students. We also implemented 52 exterior access points at 26 of our campuses, which basically began, uh, allowed us to have like a drive up uh, wireless access. And we had about 1,000 unique users. And then I didn't put it on here. We also took uh, hotspots and we put them in high density areas, uh, multifamily areas, uh, mobile home parks. And we set up what we called WOWS Wireless on Wheels, where we put multiple vehicles in a site where people could come up and get access. And then with the contact center, we supported over 12,500 calls, emails, and chats to the various support queues that we set up. So the adoption rate was very, very high. So I know I'm. Uh, Getting short on time, what I want to do is uh, touch base on some of the things that, that we're looking at as considerations for our, this coming school year. Obviously, you know, we have the WebEx piece in place. I feel like we got to continue to stack upon that and continue to, you know, build upon the great adoption we had in place in the spring. In addition, with device access, we, you know, doing that ratio of two students to one device, that worked in the spring. That's not going to work in the fall. So we see that we're, we're going to have to have device access for everybody so that we maintain the flexibility when you start looking at the scenarios, right? So if you have, even if you start off with a large percent of your students face-to-face, -face, what happens if you have to, you know, pivot with another stay-at-home order? What if you have a localized outbreak of COVID where you have to, you know, close a, a, a campus or a few different campuses? We believe that we're in a situation where to have that ultimate flexibility, students are going to have to have a device. They're also going to have to have uh, internet access. We're continuing to try to expand more, um, more in the area of hotspots. Some other technology that we're digging into uh, is, is private LTE. When you start looking at private LTE, the capabilities of that and how that potentially could help serve, especially like regions that have a high uh, density of people with need. That's a pretty promising technology, so we're looking heavily at that. And then, you know, there's other technologies uh, as well, not necessarily short term, but starting to think a little longer term when you look at like satellite based uh, technology, Starlink, for example, um, th that's supposed to be commercially available in the fall of 2020. Amazon is also working on a solution uh, with satellite based technology. Uh, so those, those are things we're trying to keep a pulse on. And I think ultimately what we're what it really comes down to is defining basically use cases for technology. And, and we've spent some time this past week, or really last last several weeks, kind of whiteboarding scenarios. So we know like in a in a 100 percent in-person learning scenario, you know, WebEx is going to play a key part into that because you're going to have this continued need for parent contact and from parent contact. If you want to call them, then um Hybrid calling could still serve a great purpose for, for a, a staff member. Also, you know, there are situations, even if you go one or 100% in person, the reality of it is at some point somebody's going to have to quarantine or it might be, you know, the student has to quarantine or a handful of students have to quarantine where you might have majority of your class in, in the uh, in-person scenario, uh, but you're going to have to bring some kids in. WebEx is still going to play a big role in that. Uh, also, when you think about 100% virtual, so the students or families that elect to do our 100% virtual option, WebEx is still going to be an important part to stay connected with those students. So those students would also have WebEx access and have meetings with their uh, virtual teachers. And then another unique situation or concept that we're kicking around is this idea of, you know, especially at a grade level where you have a quarantine support model. And what that really is, is if you had, um, you know, situations where you had students coming in and out of, let's say, third grade. Now, it's not ideal from a pacing perspective, but students, essentially, if a staff member was assigned to help support those students in a virtual model, if they followed their scope and sequence, those students could be coming in or out of what the district scope and sequence is within a couple days. And on a quarantine, that might end up being 
you know, 21 days, maybe as much as a month. Another scenario is, you know, where a teacher might be quarantined, right? So now you start looking at that. And if you're looking at the elegance of that, one of the things we're trying to do is make this easy. So we're looking at, for example, um, some of the Cisco uh, room kits, their mobile video endpoints, where those devices show up as a piece of hardware and they just join the meeting. So we think that has a lot of potential. And then, you know, ultimately, too, when you look at a complete hybrid where if you had some of your kids at home, some of the kids on campus, you know, the video endpoint option might be uh, an option. But also, you know, in our case, every teacher has a laptop and an iPad. We've tested the, the process of having the teacher carry their device. And if you didn't have, let's say, two mobile devices, would a teacher be willing to use their cell phone with a, a tool like WebEx where they could, you know, use that as their audio, use their teacher computer to project, that might work as well. And then obviously we have to uh, respond to a, a stay at home order. So I think um, those are some of the things we're thinking about. And I think lastly, just looking at other areas outside of WebEx and device access, whatever, you know, we're deep at, at this point looking at scheduling, you know, building out our schedules for students that enroll for the virtual option, face-to-face -face option, you know, if we're looking at using other resources, how are we going to onboard, do single sign-on, you know, roster those those other applications, set up the data integrations. We're deep into that as well. So I know uh, my time is up, and those are just some of the things that we've done last spring and that we're looking to do for uh, 2021. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. That was really great. And thanks again for joining us today. Next up, we have Mike Griffin who leads our collaboration IoT practice here at NetSync. Mike has led the collaboration efforts that have helped numerous clients stay connected and productive during the pandemic. During these challenging times, Mike and his team of collaboration professionals have designed and deployed successful and secure collaboration rollouts in record times. Mike has over 20 years of experience designing, installing, and helping clients plan for future growth with the help of advanced collaboration solutions. Today, Mike will be discussing hybrid technology options that will enable students to easily, seamlessly, and successfully learn remotely. Take away, Mike. Thank you, Mark. So when we talk about hybrid classroom or hybrid participation in a remote learning environment, the first thing we have to figure out is that if you're doing all remote, meaning all the kids, all the teachers are remote, that's not near as big of a deal as if you're now starting to bring kids into the classroom in the physical space along with the teacher and then having kids at home in a remote learning capacity. So when we're talking about distance learning, if they're all remote, it, there are some challenges, but it is a lot more simple than when we bring kids in person and remote at the same time. And the reason for that is you've got to account for a lot of different things. You've got to account for good audio quality. You've got to account for the video being able to see everybody in the room, including the teacher. You've got to account for how you're going to share content both internally, uh, you know, within the class and then virtually across the meeting with folks that are or the kids that are at home. So when we look at all of that and we define what hybrid really means, there are lots of different use cases, which Brian pointed out uh, in the segment before, it, before me, but really it boils down to four different technology solutions that you can plug into all of those different use cases. And really what those are is there's the all remote collaboration, right? We said that one is pretty straightforward. There is some uh, you know, training that must be done and, and participation from the teachers and the students and all of that. Uh, but that is pretty straightforward. The second is, uh, you know, how do we have mobile endpoints that we can roll into a classroom that might be a temporary solution uh, to fit one of those use cases that Brian mentioned. And then when we're done, we can roll it into a different classroom or to a different school for that matter. Uh, and make it very mobile and very easy to use for teachers. The next one is fixed video endpoints. So in this scenario, it could be, you know, Brian mentioned some of these use cases, but it could be we have a classroom dedicated to distance learning where the teacher might be in the class, but all the students are remote, or maybe there's a hybrid, there's some kids in class and some kids uh, remote. 
but in that case, what you need to figure out is what use case makes the most sense for the mobile cart, what use case makes the most sense for the fixed video endpoint. In both cases, you're going to need to make sure that it fits the use case appropriately. Is the audio uh, you know, microphone good enough to pick up the entire class to fit that use case? Does the microphone only need to be good enough to pick up the teacher, right? Is the video going to be able to zoom in on a, on a student that is speaking so that the kid at home can hear and see the question? You know, when we start talking about SPED and deaf ed and things of that nature, it becomes critically important that those children can see and pick up facial cues and read lips and, you know, I uh, participate in the class as if they were there so they can continue their learning. Uh, you know, Brian mentioned a lot of different use cases where we might be all at home, all in person, a hybrid thereof, and the different scenarios for that. These technology solutions are really designed for you to pick what makes the most sense for the use case in your application. And then the fourth is really about how do I use technology that I already have and maybe couple it with web collaboration tools like WebEx or WebEx Teams to bring those remote participants into the classroom. An example of that might be iPads. There is technology out there that allows you to put an iPad on a swivel and, you know, walk around with a microphone that's, you know, tagged to your lapel and it would track you. And, and that would work fine if it was just the teacher. The problem you come into or you're going to face is if I also have kids in the classroom, how do I make sure when they're speaking that we can hear them? And then how do you couple the microphone on that lapel mic with an overhead speaker so that the kids in the classroom can hear, but then you don't get interference and echo, right? So if I'm talking through the mic when it comes through the speakers, well, the mic's gonna pick that up and it's gonna create interference and issues. So there are purpose-built devices for this type of solution that we're recommending specifically so that you don't you don't run into these technical challenges because we're all talking about moving at a very quick pace uh, to fit these use cases and the runway is not long couple that with technical challenges you need to make it very simple if i have to tell a teacher okay you you power up your ipad you set it inside this this device you put the power on, you put your mic, make sure the mic's paired and then test it. So you're walking around. Oh, and then go back to the iPad and launch your WebEx client, start the meeting. You know, all of those things add complexity to a teacher that is probably already overwhelmed with what's going on and that needs to focus on teaching those kids rather than struggling with technology. So when we're talking about what we're recommending and why at the heart of it, it is rapid deployment, and ease of use for the teacher so the teacher can focus on teaching the kids. So when, when we look at uh, hybrid, when we come into uh, the hybrid scenario and when we go through all of those different use cases and we talk about the four options that really boil down to, which again are, uh, you know, WebEx, WebEx teams for complete re remote learning or rem remote participants, a video endpoint that is on a mobile cart so that you can move around and be agile with it, a video endpoint that is fixed in a dedicated video distance learning room, and then the fourth option of using technology that you already have with, in conjunction with WebEx or WebEx Teams, then you have to start looking at how do I plug those into all the different use cases that Brian went through and what makes the most sense for me. And I think at the end of the day, we're, we're well equipped to help you and guide you through that and what we've seen with other districts. So we'd love to, to have those conversations with you and help you through that, uh, that journey. But I did wanna show you <clears throat> what some of these video endpoints uh, and solutions might look like. I know I've got uh, about 10 minutes total in this segment, so I wanna make sure I at least give you some visualization. So when we're talking about the WebEx board, the WebEx board would be a mobile option that we propose so that uh, a teacher, a non-technical person, can roll this in, plug it into power, and it's done. It's literally that simple. It has all everything built into it, the microphone, the display, 
the uh, codec, the video camera, everything is plugged in in, in in a succinct package so that the technology just gets out of the way and they plug it in and they start going, right? And this is what that might look like. Now, this is mounted onto a wall, but we could also put this on a, on a rolling cart so that they just roll it in, plug it into power, and you're done. The second option is what we're calling a room kit mini. Now, this is really uh, designed to for a teacher to have uh, a, a communication with students that are remote. This is not a solution where you're gonna have kids in class and remote. The WebEx board that I just mentioned previously is the perfect mobile solution for that uh, because it has dynamic microphones that can up the DB gain if somebody's in the back. It has uh, digital speaker track, so if somebody's speaking, it will zoom in on them uh, automatically and the teacher really has to do nothing to make all that work. The Room Kit Mini is a less expensive option, but it's designed so that you can uh, roll that into a teacher's classroom that now needs to teach kids remotely from a classroom. An example of that might be like a science lab where they need to roll it up pretty close so that they can show the students what they're doing within the lab. Uh, and then if they wanted to record that, of course, anything that we're doing or talking about today can be recorded as well and shared with kids at a later date. So the next option is the Room Kit Plus. Now, this is a fixed video option that is designed for large rooms, right? So this is kind of the front view of what you see here. Uh, and you have the option of what's called presenter track. So the view that you might see from this picture could be a rear facing camera that follows the educator around as they move throughout the room. It could zoom in on them if they're trying to point out something specific. Uh, and then if they want to flip it and show the classroom, well, you have the, the quad camera there that you see against the wall that would show the teacher and the, the kids within the room. And here's another example of what that might look like. The WebEx Room Kit is another option for smaller classrooms uh, in a fixed video uh, capacity where you can have kids and the teacher in, in the classroom and then kids at home as well. I will say this is more for smaller classrooms, not necessarily the, the larger lecture rooms or larger classrooms generally. Uh, but in this option, uh, it is going to be less expensive than the Room Kit Plus. You would not have necessarily the rear facing camera. Uh, and as you can see, it's, it's a single camera instead of a quad camera for, uh, you know, less, uh, less capability for the size of the room, if that makes sense. Then the Room Kit Mini, uh, this is, uh, again, very similar to what we discussed in the mobile option, but you can also have a fixed, uh, this in a fixed configuration on a wall somewhere as well. This is designed for very small huddle spaces, two to four people. Uh, so you really don't want to have any kids in the classroom. This is more focused on the teacher uh, if they're going to teach from a physical space to a large number of, of remote participant students out there. And then finally, this is what might it might look like for a student that is participating in a class that is a, a distance learning, digital learning uh, class. The teacher uh, and the in-room experience would have a video endpoint. Uh, you can change your display. What you're seeing here is what we call grid view, so you can see all the kids at once, which is really important when we're talking about, uh, you know, especially in the elementary um, and, and some in secondary as well. But you need to be able to, as a teacher, see all of the kids and what they're doing. Are they paying attention? Can they, can you get their attention if you need it? Uh, and then from a, a kid's point of view at home, they could see this view as well, or they could change it to active speaker so that you get a big video view of, of whomever that might be. Additionally, when again, going back to SPED and Deaf Ed, it's, it's critically important if we have interpreters or kids need to see facial cues and, and recognition of that type, that we have the ability to pin certain video uh, windows so they could pin their teacher, pin their interpreter. So no matter how many kids are in the, the meeting, they're always gonna see their teacher and their interpreter at all times. So those are some important keys as well to, to think about. And finally, I just wanted to show you this kind of pro-con chart of the different video endpoints that we've gone through. 
and, and really where the benefits lie for each one of them, right? So I'm going to go through this really quickly. Again, don't have a ton of time today, but I definitely wanted to uh, show you this at a high level and be happy to go into it with detail uh, if, if you need to after the, after the webinar. So we've got this broken into mobile and fixed. Uh, on the mobile option, that first 55-inch WebEx board, the pros are it's really easy to use. You roll it in, you plug it in, you're done. It's mobile. It's got really good microphone array so that it will automatically detect who's speaking and boost the gain on those mics if they're in the back of the room versus in the front of the room. It makes it very, very simple. It is, it is the best mobile option if you're going to have kids in class and remote at home. The price is, uh, or I'm sorry, the con is one of those is price. It is more expensive than some of these other options. Uh, and it's not as easy to repurpose post COVID. Right? And what I mean by that is that there are usually screens in most classrooms already, whether it be projectors, LCDs, TVs, whatever. Um, so this is all built in one unit. I'm not saying you can't repurpose it, but you probably repurpose it for something different than an in-classroom uh, type activity, right? So it could be for, uh, you know, a flip, or not a flip classroom, but it could be for like remote uh, field trips, or it could be for, if I need to have a, uh, a dual language speaking teacher sub or something along those lines, you, you could definitely repurpose it. It's just not as easy. Uh, the Room Kit Mini, an advantage to this is it's lower cost. Uh, it's easy to repurpose after COVID. You can put these in principal conference rooms. You can put them in break rooms. You can put them in classrooms, lots of different room uh, options there. Uh, it is not, uh, it is good as long as there are no kids in the classroom. Again, remember, this is a small video appointment meant for small huddle space. Uh, it is mobile as well. Uh, some of the cons to that one is it's higher maintenance, right? If you're talking about putting it on a mobile cart, you're going to have a display. It's going to have cables going from the display to the uh, room kit mini. Uh, there could have some input issues or source issues on the TV. Uh, so it's not as go user friendly, if, if that makes sense, uh, than the WebEx board is, but it would still work. The fixed video endpoint options, we talked about some of these pluses. Uh, the audio quality is going to be great. It's got the quad camera with the speaker track, so it will zoom in on whoever's speaking at the class. Uh, it's meant and designed for large rooms. You can do kids in the classroom and remote with this thing. It's got presenter track if you have a rear facing camera so that it'll follow the teacher as they're moving about the room uh, and it's easy to repurpose post COVID. Some of the cons, it's more expensive than some of these other options and it's not as fast to relocate and that's really the case for most of these options in the fixed configuration uh, uh, itself because you're going to physically mount them to the wall, run some cabling, things like that. The next option is the room kit with the ceiling mic. Again, great audio quality. The speaker track is there. You can do kids in the classroom and remote as long as it's not a huge classroom. Uh, it's easy to repurpose post COVID. Uh, again, it's not fat on the con side. It's not fast to relocate. There is no presenter track option for this one. Uh, and for the, the teacher and the students, they need to be pretty close to the video endpoint. Uh, so it's not meant for large rooms. And then the last fixed option is the room kit mini. The pro is it is the least expensive option. Uh, they are easy to repurpose post COVID. The con is there's no kids in the classroom. You know, you can't do this with kids in the classroom. Uh, it's for remote only that are participating with the teacher leading in a classroom. It's really designed for only two to four people. There's no presenter track option as well. So with that, I think my, uh, my time is up. So thank you very much for, for joining us today and I will pass it back down to Mark. Thank you.